with WSU for about seven years. I'm an irrigation engineer and I'm a part of the WSU extension. So anyway, part of what we do is for WSU is we printed a bunch of these manuals um, because they're great. Um, they really do have all the basics that farmers need. Um, and so on one side is water management. And as you read along, if you're starting to read upside down, then you've gone into the irrigation equipment, equipment maintenance part of it. And so there is uh, stuff on the equipment maintenance as well as on the water management. So this is published by the National Center for Appropriate Technology. My favorite word there is appropriate because it really is, you know, it's not stuff you don't need. Most of it really is very applicable to what you do need. And so uh, there's a lot of formulas in here. You can, there's there's uh, things that you can use to, to do a pump test um, to see if, if it's time to uh, you know, rewind your pump, how, how your pump's doing. There's uh, formulas to, to help you know how much water you're actually applying with a big gun based on what your spacing is and what your full speed is and your flow rate um, and a lot of those other things that, that you probably um, would need. So without further ado, uh, we'll reference it as we go along. And please, you know, interrupt me. I'm just a, I mean, just a regular guy, so. So basically, what I wanted to talk about is irrigation scheduling. Basically, this is the idea of when do we turn it on, when do we start irrigating, and uh, how much do we apply when we do irrigate, and um, that kind of, uh, of an idea. Um, and why do we care about this? Because you can, I mean, everybody knows, even the Indians, uh, when they were, you know, growing crops way back before anybody showed up, you know that yield is very tightly uh, determined by, by water management. So you can get better yields, better quality. Um, you can lower your pumping bills, um, and those, we all know, can be significant. Um, when we don't need to, that, that has cost to us in terms of our pumping bills as well as our labor that it takes to, to go set those, those irrigation sets up and move those uh, uh, big guns around. Sorry. Okay. Um, we lower our fertilizer costs because a lot of times if we're over irrigating, we're rinsing those fertilizers out of our soil and they go down into the, the groundwater and past the root zone where the, the plants can't get to it anymore. Um, and we lose the, the benefit of that, that, that fertilizer that we paid quite a bit of money for. Um, and then we can avoid this unwanted attention from environmental interests. Um, in general, yields um, behave like... Oh, you're... Uh, oh, sorry. Just problem with the audio. There we go. Oh. Um, do you want me to test it or? No, okay. In general, <clears throat> yields kind of look like this, where you've got the more water you apply, you get better and better yields. We all know that water stress hurts, uh, crop yields, that things don't grow as good when, they're, when they don't have water. But there's a limit. And after a while, applying additional water actually hurts yields. And you know, it's, it's very common across uh, all crops, basically. So over uh, irrigating increases these incidents of all these plant diseases that are encouraged by wet, humid environments like blights, molds, rots, wilts that we can avoid if we don't over irrigate. Um, obviously, there's, if you over irrigate, there's less oxygen in the root zone and you have yield loss associated with that. You reduce uh, with a lot of vegetable crops um, that reduces storability of onions and potatoes and stuff um, when, when they're over irrigating. Um, and then additional labor pumping and fertilizer costs, and then, you know, difficulty with harvesting and cultural operations when it's hard to get back into the field if it's too wet. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, I used to, we had a dairy farmer north of Landon, and I, he used to talk about crops being sacked by the colder temperatures of irrigation. Yeah. And I think he was, he was from Holland originally, yeah. and I just kind of wondered, uh, if, you, if, there, if, you if ever, there's anything to that. If there's anything to that. Yeah. Actually, um, if, you, if, if, a, if plants need water, 
then irrigating them helps. But it does actually, uh, plant growth a lot of times is determined by soil temperature. Um, and when we irrigate too soon, a lot of times in the spring, and then we actually cool the soil down with that water, and it does. Uh, but you think it should be most of the soil. It wouldn't be a shock to the plant. You no, know, it's mostly. 40 the some degree water. <laughs> yeah, I think it's mostly the soil. I think most plants can handle it. Because, it, it, I mean, it's only wet for just a short amount of time. I, mean, it's, I don't think it's that big a deal. But soil takes a long time to heat up and cool down. So I think that would have to figure out. So over irrigating, <laughs> you know, some people just don't know when to turn it off. Most people uh, in Washington State, you know, we did a survey, and it's most people, what they do is they look at the condition of the crop to know when to irrigate. Um, and what's the problem with this? It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. You've already taken a yield hit. If you see water stress, you've already, you've already had a, a yield reduction due to that. So, uh, although, you know, that's good feedback as to where you're at. Um, uh, and, it, and you should go out and look for water stress, but hopefully the idea is to avoid this water. And then the look in the feel of the soil, this is this uh, grab the soil and, and, and kind of uh, make a ball out of it. I've actually got some hamlets, probably not enough, of the NRCS. Oh, maybe <coughs> anyway. We have some available across the road. Oh, okay, good. That's. Determine soil moisture by look and feel, <clears throat> and uh, basically you dig up some dirt and then you squeeze it, and basically depends on the kind of soil. If it's a sandy soil, it, it acts differently than clay soils, etc. But generally, if it, it'll hold its shape, then it's got more moisture than a dry soil, which will fall apart and it won't leave water or stains on your hands, etc. So, <clears throat> and there's ways to, to do that, and that's a great pamphlet. Uh, been around forever and, and people still use the heck out of it. But what I would suggest when, when, when doing that is to kind of calibrate yourself to the soil because every soil is different and this method is very subjective. So what I would do is I would, if I was out there and I saw the first sign of water stress, I saw just a little bit of water stress, I would go out there and then dig some, some soil and, and do the look and feel method at that point and say, okay, this is what the soil looks like when it's too dry. I don't want to get here in the future. And then you just kind of calibrate yourself with your experience to your soil. And I think over time you can get better at it. Personal calendar. <clears throat> and so, uh, which is a lot of times it's just, well, sometimes in irrigation districts you get two choices, take it or leave it. And a lot of people just irrigate whether they need to or not. Um, and sometimes, well, it's Monday, let's irrigate, you know, and it has nothing to do with what's happening. So <clears throat> what we would like to do is kind of get people over here um, where doing ir data-based irrigation scheduling, get some sort of data to help you know when to irrigate. We'll talk about that. Um, ET reports, soil moisture sensors, etc. So again, um, here's what we, uh, if you're above the line, this is like from, from worst down to best. If you're doing the same schedule all season or, or not just, just irrigating on, on Wednesdays or every other week, it doesn't respond to the changing water use needs of the plant as it grows and as the season changes, then you're probably uh, going to be less profitable. Kicking the dirt, looking at the plants, uh, we, want, we like to get people down here where they're at least doing some sort of look and feel method using a shovel or soil probe, but uh, ideally doing a checkbook method using ET data from AgWeatherNet, and I'll talk to you about that. So moisture monitoring, we'll talk about this, and then ideally you do some sort of a combination between using ET. ET is evapotranspiration, or we can get estimates of how much water crops are using um, from these weather networks. Um, that I'll talk about. Uh, but anyway, combining that with the soil moisture probe is, is, is the best way to do things. Okay, so briefly, let me uh, want to do a, a little demonstration. So this is my soil, and uh, let's just pretend we got crops growing up in the top of it, you know, and then down as we go down through here. Um, and if you get below the bottom of this soil 
roots only go so deep, and so if I if water goes down below the bottom of this, then that water is going to be lost. So, so let's take how, how deep do the roots go on different? Uh, well, <coughs> on, on corn, uh, corn is usually about three feet. It depends if you've got root, a hard restrictive layer, which there's probably not too many of those around. Right there, like to a hard pan or or like a bedrock or something. Sometimes. I mean that's going to definitely restrict it, but but corn roots go down about three feet. How about alfalfa? Alfalfa goes down quite a bit further, like four or five, even six feet, and that's why alfalfa is much more resistant to drought. It's just a drought-resistant plant to begin with. Alfalfa is really uh, easy to man, hard to. There's a lot more forgiveness with alfalfa, and I'll talk about why. Is that the main thing that accounts for different? Uh, I guess susceptibilities to drought or different, you know, yeah. abilities to withstand drought. Is, is root depth? Is root depth definitely makes a huge difference. Um, the the crop's ability to withstand drought. For potatoes, for example, uh, the root depth is what foot and a half, okay. and so they're just they just run out of water sooner. They just have a smaller container to hold water. Where if you've got a really deep root zone, it's just it uses water about the same rate, but it's just got a lot to draw from before it runs out. So, so vegetables, uh, they grow cucumbers up here as well. Um, anyway, some of the, the vegetables in general have sh shallow roots, but things like wheat, corn, um, a lot of these row crops, uh, um, alfalfa definitely has very deep roots. It's kind of a, out there. Um, grass, grass hay kind of has deeper roots, two or three. Okay, so here's my uh, my root zone. Okay, so I'm putting water in there. I'm irrigating. Yeah, I, well, let's we'll call it. I'm drip irrigating. I'm very efficient. You kind of see it's swelling. Some soils will actually do this as I irrigate. And an interesting thing. What's that? It is swelling. Yeah, it's getting puffed up. Um, as I, even though I'm pouring water right in the center, it does move sideways from, from the point. So even though I'm putting water right here, water will move sideways. In fact, if I sit this here long enough, this will all come to equilibrium after a while and it will all be equally wet or dry. Um, just because what happens is, you know how when you set a coffee cup down, it leaves a little ring, or if you got a cold soda or something, it leaves a ring. But what happens is water likes to stick to things. And it also likes to stick to itself. It's a polar molecule. The, the two uh, hydrogen atoms are kind of off to the one side of the oxygen atom. And so it, it's, it's got a positive and a negative side, and so it likes to stick together. And that's what makes raindrops coalesce. That's what causes surface tension. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is what makes all kinds of things possible in life. And one thing, so, but one thing that, so the water in that soil particle, it likes to stick to that soil particle. If there's, a, there's a molecular force there. And it also likes to stick to other water molecules. And so it'll pull this other water back behind it. But it comes to after a while, it, it you know, because that, that sticking force, gravity is greater than that sticking force because of the pore spaces between those soil particles and the water will just continue to drain through. So <clears throat> that force that the, the soil pulls on the water is actually called matrix potential and you can, we can measure this in PSI or vacuum, any units of pressure or vacuum, we can measure the force that, that water pulls uh, the soil pulls on water, and that's what's happening. So if I irrigate here, I've got more water, and it's being pulled sideways because the forces over here, because there's less water, are pulling the water from the wet spots to the dry spots. And this is what allows, you know, if you drip irrigate, the water will actually move sideways over time um, with that. But sometimes it takes, it takes some time for that water to move sideways. And so sometimes when you when people drip irrigate, they'll drip irrigate for two hours, shut it off, give it some time to move sideways, put some more water on, and then shut it off. And that way it'll kind of encourage it to move more laterally. <coughs> well, let me fill the soil up. 
So I'm just going to flood it. Okay, <clears throat> so my soil is full. Oops. And right now, if I irrigate, or let's say it rains, you know, the soil's full, this happens in the spring all the time, right? And it rains again, and so what happens? It just goes right on through the, the, the soil. The soil can only hold so much water, even though from the top, I put the water on, it looks like I'm doing some good, but actually the soil can't hold on to all of that water. And so what will happen is gravity will pull that, that water down through the soil profile and it will move down past the bottom of the root zone and that water will be lost. Um, not only that, um, plants, uh, their roots, they don't have knives and forks. They can't carve the, the nutrients off of the soil particles where those nutrients are sometimes held. They've only got um, straws. And they can only suck up nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all these micronutrients. They can only suck up these nutrients that are in solution. And so what happens is, and, and not all nutrients are always in solution. Sometimes they're, they're held on the soil particles. Sometimes they're in solution. But the only nutrients that are available are the ones that are in solution, immediately available. And so if I, if I over-irrigate, I rinsed some of those nutrients out of my soil and I lost those. So more water isn't better in this case because I, I, I've rinsed, I've lost the benefit of some of my fertilizer that I applied. Okay. So this, this point, <clears throat> this full point of the soil is called field capacity. That's the field's maximum capacity to hold water. And so as the plant uses water, <coughs> there's, there's quite a bit of water there, and as I first I just squeeze it a little bit, what happens is the plant roots create what's called an osmotic potential, and they can pull that water away from the soil, and that force within the plant root hair is greater than that, that matrix potential, the force that, that the soil is pulling on it, and they can pull the water away from the soil. And so as it pulls the water away, at first it's, it's quite easy. I'm just squeezing a little bit and I'm, and, and a lot, I'm getting a lot of water um, away from the soil. So I'm, I'm not working very hard, the plant's not working very hard and it's getting all the water it needs. Um, however, after a while, so there's, there's quite a bit of water left in the soil, but it's not readily available. In other words, the, the forces of the, the soil pulling on that water exceeds the, the plant's ability to create that osmotic potential to pull that water away. And the plant's got to work harder and harder in the, to get the water and it becomes less and less available. And so at this point, the plant will start um, shutting down. The stomates, the little openings in, in the plant leaves that open and shut that allow the exchange of water, uh, water vapor as well as uh, carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, they'll close these little openings in the leaves. They'll close um, on corn. You know, the leaves will curl like this and kind of turn. Um, <clears throat> what they're doing is they're trying to limit their exposure to sunlight and that energy so that they don't they don't continue to lose water. Because if they continue to lose water at the same rate, the plant's going to be dead in just a little bit. So it's got to it's got to use water at a lower rate, and so it's doing all this stuff to uh, limit the loss of water. And this, these are the plant water stress responses. In beans, you'll see that they'll kind of change color a little bit. They'll go to a darker color. Corn uh, will roll grass, like a bluegrass. It's usually a, a, a blade of grass. If you look at it really close, it's open like this, and it'll shut um, when it's water stressed. A lot of these other things uh, will happen. Um, in other words, this, at this point, we're starting to, to lose yield. And we lose more and more yield until there's a point where no matter how hard the plant tries to get water away from the soil, it just can't do it. And uh, the plant just says, okay, I can't support life anymore. And it shut down, shuts down and dies. Um, and so this is called permanent wilting point. There's water left in the soil, but the plant can't get, get, the plant can't get it. And so it's dead. 
So what, we, what we're looking at, so saturation is mud. You guys are more familiar with this point than we are on the east side. Um, so this is completely full. And then we get field capacity. If you give this a while and give it time and there's space somewhere for the water to go, it'll drain out um, and you'll get to the maximum point that, that that soil can hold long term against that pull of gravity and that's called field capacity. So this is full. And then down to here, this is our available soil moisture. We get to where there's, there's still water left in the soil but it's, it's not available to the plants, the permanent wilting point. And then if you continue, you know, you have an oven or some other way to get that water away so to where you completely dry it down, then you get to oven dry. So this, this water is unavailable. <coughs> this, is, this is our bucket. This is, this is what we want to manage water in between. We want to keep water between field capacity and then permanent wilting point. So of course every soil holds different amounts of water depending on the soil texture. So if I've got a bucket of gravel, how many points are there where the two um, rocks come together where it can stick to the stick to the gravel and also stick to the water can stick to itself and those capillary forces can in other words so that's very small and if you go down 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 you get a silt loam and even down to a clay they'll they that holds different amounts of water so obviously a sand can't hold very much water and then these peat and mucks. Um, the higher the organic matter content, then the more it can hold. And the other thing is, is look at the range in these numbers. And it's because even with the same soil texture, if I've just got a silt soil, for example, let's say I've got a silt loam soil, if I've completely pulverized the soil and it has no structure at all, no organic matter content, it can't hold as much water as a soil that's got a lot of organic matter it's got a lot of structure, and structure basically means clumpiness. Clumpiness and little teeny clods that the soil uh, gets, and that's a good thing. It helps you, you can kind of, if I simulate it with this, this sponge, if it's full of water, um, and then versus if I smash it flat, it can't, can't hold as much water. Anyway. So uh, there's a large range, and so it, it, all, it, it all kind of depends. But we can think of this as a bucket. And the size of our bucket, uh, and the, this bucket can hold um, water and nutrients for use later by the plant. We get water into the bucket by irrigation or rainfall to get water in. We get water out, ET is evapotranspiration, evaporation off the soil surface transpiration through the leaves, you know, sucked up through the roots and then and, and, and transpired out of the leaves. So together, evaporation plus transpiration, evapotranspiration, or ET, that's how much water the plant is actually using every day. So this is water out, okay? So get water in, water out, fill capacity is full. If we fill it more than this, this bucket can hold, it'll overflow. You know, uh, actually it goes out the bottom, but we can just kind of th think of it as overflowing our bucket. Um, and wilting point is empty. We don't want to get down to wilting point because this is dead, right? We don't even want to get, you know, all the way near wilting point usually because that's when we start to see uh, a lot of water stress. So in order to manage our soil water, we need to know how full is our bucket. Because if we know how full our bucket is, then we know how much space we have up here to irrigate so we can know how much water to apply and when to apply it. <clears throat> so if we have a deep, back to your question about the depth of the root zone, if we have a deep soil, our bucket is bigger. If we have um, a different, you know, like a, a silt soil, it's wider versus a, a deep sand. So two things determine the size of our bucket, the water holding capacity of our soil and the depth of the root zone. And so Oops. Here we have a deep silt soil or a deep sand or a deep silt or a shallow silt or we have a shallow sand. So <coughs> you can have, so obviously where, if, where are we going to see water stress first? Shallow sand. Because 
plants don't care what kind of soil they're grown in. They really don't. They only care about whether they've got access to water and whether they've got access to nutrients. And they need, the, they need that amount of water and they, they need it when they need it. And so this ET is the same regardless of, of where we are. So if that's the same, we're going to run out of water here in a hurry. And, and if we've got these two soils in the same field, this is going to be fine and fine and fine and fine and fine. And this will be practically dead um, before we see any water stress over here. And this is where the you know misconception, oh, that's a sandy soil. You really got to pour the water to that soil. You got to irrigate twice as much every time to the sandy soil. Well what, well, what would happen if I irrigate twice as much every time I come around to my sandy soil? It'd just go right out the bottom. The soil can't hold on to it. That's the whole point. So if I've got a sandy soil, you can grow great crops in sand, pure sand. Um, <clears throat> but this, it just can't hold on to that water. So I've got to irrigate smaller amounts and much more frequently in order to in order to make it make it work. And then this this is why you know alfalfa it's much more forgiving. It, you know this it's got this huge bucket full of water and it, it'll just use it and use it. And then um, if I over and and if I drain it down and then I put too much water on it, well I've got a lot of space in that bucket to put more water in there, etc. And so it will be fine. So uh, from full, if both of these were full, let's say we got a really heavy rainfall and all, all the, the, the soil everywhere where is full, and then after a few days of water use, um, if I have a sandy spot or a silt spot, this will be about empty and this one will, will, will still be fine. <clears throat> and it's a common misconception. I even find myself doing it. I see this sandy or shallow part of my yard it's always water stress. Well, maybe I'll leave the sprinkler on there a little while longer. Well, no, I, sh I need to just irrigate more frequently. It's more work for me. Okay, so as we get from field capacity and we go down to permanent wilting point, field capacity is full, permanent wilting point is an empty bucket, we get this production, this production function. So we get maximum production, it's got all the water it needs, and then we get to a point where we're starting to see more and more water stress. The plant's starting to short, shut down more and more and more. Um, and then, so we get more and more reduced production. So this is kind of how most plants will respond. Every plant does it a little differently. Alfalfa, for instance, is fairly uh, drought tolerant. So it's going to come around here and then go across a little further before it drops off. Um, vegetables, potatoes, lettuce, things like that, cabbage they're going to start dropping off much sooner because they just don't like to see water stress. But we can pick up uh, this called a management allowable deficit or maximum allowable deficiency, whatever, MAD. This is the point where we start to see water stress. So what we do is we say, okay, for maximum production, I want my soil water content between field capacity and MAD. I don't want to be over here. I want my bucket only to be half full in this instance. So, if we wanted to do a, a kind of a simple water budget, we would look up what the water holding capacity of a silt loam soil, and we, everything we do in irrigation is, is in one dimension, because we don't want to, you know, even though we're irrigating with a volume of water, we, we think in terms of how much water is used everywhere, so we just do uh, look in one dimension. So, it's, we look at water holding capacity of a silt loam soil is in two inches per foot of soil. So in, in a one foot of soil, <clears throat> if that soil is you know, at permanent wilting point, I can add two inches of water to that and that soil is going to hold all of that water in that one foot of soil uh, before it starts moving down into the next layer of the wall. So uh, we can look it up. Two inches per foot for a silt loam soil. My effective rooting depth, let's say we're growing potatoes or something that's fairly shallow, 1.5 feet. So how much water total can we put in that? How big is my bucket? How much water total can we put in that one and a half foot of, of soil? Well, one and a half feet times two inches per foot. So two, three inches. However, so in my, so one and a half feet, 
That's how much soil I want to use. I can hold three inches there. But I don't want to completely deplete it. I only want to use half of that water. So we chose a, a, an MAD of 50%. And so the soil water deficit at 50%, so three and a half, so 50% of that, that three inches, inch and a half. So inch and a half is the maximum amount of water we would want to deplete before we irrigate again. And at that time, we would apply an inch and a half of water. Um, <clears throat> so we can look up this ET rate, how much water, we can estimate how much water plants are using. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Um, and then we can get a quarter inch per day. You know, this is kind of high for this area, but let's say a quarter of an inch a day. On the time to the water, the full profile to MED. So inch and a half divided by that quarter of an inch per day. So in this case, we would need to irrigate every six days. And at that point, we would irrigate an uh, inch and a half. So, but if we wanted to, if we want to have maximum production, would it hurt us to irrigate just a little, you know, deplete just a little bit and then irrigate back up? It doesn't matter. So we can, more frequently, and smaller amounts um, will always keep us a little safer. So what we can do if we, you know, time days, days of the year across the bottom here, and then <clears throat> we can say, okay, this is full. If we apply more water than this field capacity line, it'll go out the bottom. And here's wilting point. You're dead. We don't want to get there. Here's our MAD line. In this point, in this example, we did 50% of this and so we said fill capacity MAD line and so we can track our soil water content over time and what happens see down here we, we irrigate and that pushes the soil water content back up we have a little bit of rainfall using water every day irrigate again push the soil water content back up in this example we over irrigated a little bit the soil couldn't hold on to it and we lost a little to deep percolation um, but it in general did a, a pretty good job of, of managing the soil water content in this field over time. At the end of the season, they probably dry it down on purpose, like you would for corn or whatever, so that uh, if you're harvesting for, for grain, but you need it to to uh, to dry off. Okay, we talked about that. So, how do we estimate crop water use or evapotranspiration? ET. What we do, we say ET is crop evapotranspiration, how much water a plant uses every day. Well, every plant is different, every day is different. So what we do is we estimate how much water a reference crop, in this case we, we usually use alfalfa. We say alfalfa, if it's this high and you know it's not cut, everything is great for alfalfa right now, this is, it would be using we can model based on, um, we can measure the weather data. We, can, we have these models that will estimate how much water alfalfa would be using. So we measure soil, uh, solar radiation, we measure wind speed, measure the temperature, we measure the humidity. And with those things, based, and also our, our elevation and our uh, latitude, we can come up with an estimate of how much water alfalfa would be using on that particular day. So we've got this reference ET, and then we multiply it by a crop coefficient that's specific to that particular crop. So maybe corn uses more water than alfalfa, but when it's small, it uses less, and so that crop coefficient is gonna change over time. So this is like, for example, this is a crop coefficient for potatoes. It, go, it starts out small, and then it kind of comes across, and it changes with time. So if it's, if it's equal to 1, then it would be using as much water as alfalfa. If it's less than 1, it would be using less than that. So <clears throat> this is in reality about what it looks like, but what we do is we try to simplify it, and we make it into this these um, four different stages. We say, okay, when corn pops up, it, uses, it doesn't use much water for a while. It's just kind of starts out here, but then it grows taller and taller and taller and it gets bigger and it uses more and more water as it gets big, and then it reaches the full full cover. In other words, it's, it's, it's using all the sunlight that's available. Usually this is about tasseling point for, for corn. 
and then it kind of levels off and it goes flat. And this is and, and during this time is when it's it's got all the infrastructure it needs to do what it came to this world to do, which is create corn seed. And so it's using all the sunlight and everything, and it's putting all this energy into this corn seed. And so this is the maximum water use for this crop. And then in a lot of crops, uh, it's done, you know, it's done doing what it came to this world to do, and it starts shutting down, and it'll start to senesce, um, die off, the leaves will shut down. So it'll use less and less. So with five dates, we see emergence date, or this plant planting date, where the canopy exceeds 10% of the field. So this is when it really starts to grow, and then maximum full cover date, and then initial maturation, and then end of the growing season or harvest right there. So with those five dates and three numbers, initial, full cover, and this final crop coefficient, we can define this whole curve. And this makes it easier for us to play with these numbers. This reference ET changes a lot over time. So this is alfalfa crop water use uh, that we modeled over a single season. A couple of things to, met, to notice is that it bounces all around, and this is because weather is highly variable, right? On some days it's just blazing hot outside, the sun's beating down, the wind's blowing, and uh, you have to be drinking out of a water bottle all the time. Well, the plants need a lot of water on those days too, and so we get these high points, as well as on some of these days it might be overcast, drizzly, rainy, etc. And those uh, days the plants don't need much water either, and so um, we have these low points. So it kind of bounces all around. The other thing to see is, is how this general shape of the curve is that it changes fairly drastically over the season. Um, even without the changing water use needs of, you know, of, of corn as it grows bigger, reference ET, the water demand by the atmosphere changes pretty drastically over the season. So if we're you know, irrigating at a constant rate, what happens is we're probably irrigating too much in the spring, probably too much in the fall, and you're probably under irrigating during the hot part of the summer, July and August. Coming up here pretty quick. So you can see this is you know the crop water use of a whole bunch of different um, things um, in in eastern Washington. You can see you know the crop water use needs change drastically over a season. So how can we estimate? Well, we've got this network of weather stations, uh, Washington Ag Weather Network, um, and if you can go to httbweather.wsu.edu, this is a network of weather stations. There's a lot of tools on there that are really great. Uh, you can actually have it set up because we've got all these weather stations all throughout the state, and it measures all the stuff that we need to uh, estimate <coughs> evapotranspiration or crop water use but also since we're measuring temperature, since we're measuring um, humidity and uh, wind speed, all these things that, all, that kind of affect crop water or crop production, like if maybe I want to make sure that I'm not uh, spraying when the wind speed's too high. Well, I can go on here and check what the wind speed is. I can, um, you can actually have it uh, set up uh, alerts go in there and say, well, if the wind speed exceeds, what's the wind, seven miles per hour, something like that, 10, it, then, then send me a text message, and it'll do that. Um, you can have it email you every day what the, what, the ref, what the ET was for yesterday or the last seven days, so you can set up, it's very flexible, um, a lot of tools on there. There's also uh, spray models, so like uh, if you need to know when to spray for certain wilts, or I'm not a pathologist, but um, then there's models on there that says, okay, you're probably going to see verticillium wilt on these days, etc. And so maybe right now would be a good time. Growing degree day models on there for estimating uh, crop phenological stages, uh, the development of different bugs, etc. There's where all, all the stations are. We're, we're fairly, <clears throat> we're growing fairly much, and we've got uh, quite a few weather stations in this area of the state now. Just recently, the last few years is when those went in. So here's the uh, Ag Weather Net. Uh, I won't go through, but you can have it uh, email you every day. This is what the, the, the 
last ET report was, this is an email that I had sent to me. I was using it to schedule irrigation in my uh, pasture. But we went one step further because um, getting in there, getting that data off of there, um, and, and putting it in some sort of a model and, and estimating what my daily crop water, my soil water content is, is just kind of a pain and growers weren't doing it just because it's more effort than it was worth. And so what we did is we put together um, a mobile irrigation tool. So if you've got a smartphone or even a web browser, you can set this up. It's a model that does all the, the math for you and it brings in the, the weather data from the weather network for you and, and helps you do all this stuff. So um, it's designed for use on a smartphone, but it, you can use it on any desktop um, or web browser. It's quick and easy to set up. It um, automatically pulls this ET data, the daily ET data, data from AgWeatherNet. You've tried to make it flexible so you can screw around with it and change parameters, etc. if you uh, want to play with it. Um, and it's easy to add irrigations to, and there's a lot of different multiple charts and reports. Um, so basically, what it does at the end, end of the season, these green dots, these are my irrigations. So this, it, it uh, will push the soil water content up. Blue dots, these are uh, rainfall, so this is obviously eastern Washington. Um, and then I've got my field capacity line my permanent wilting point line, and then this is my MAD line. If I, my soil water content goes below this line, then I'm in water stress. Okay, so ideally, what I want to do is keep this blue line between the top green line and this red line. Why do you think it, it increases? Why does it go up over time in the first part of the season? Uh, I mean these 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 rays. Actually, it's a growing root. It, it, it simulates um, because when you first plant corn, the root zone is only this big. So I've got a teeny bucket, tiny bucket, and then as I get as it goes over time, my bucket gets bigger, and so that changes all three of those lines. So it'll show it'll estimate a growing root zone. So uh, I wanted to try to to, to use this, but our uh, our web connection is a little slow. We can try. No, working on my phone. Is it working on your iPad? It, it's going to be really uh, that's slow. What he's got up there is the web connection. Yeah, okay. Well, basically, you go in there, and you've got to set up a username and a password. And so um, this is an AgWeatherNet username and password. And this, this allows you to keep your fields private, everything to you. Um, and so you just would go on to weather.wc.edu or agweathernet and then set up a username and password and then you log in every time. And then uh, the setup is fairly easy. You, you just choose, you, um, you name your field. So I would say potatoes or south 40 or you know uh, field pivot 3A. You know, everybody has different names for their pivots or their fields. Um, and then you choose the year, or the year that uh, we're growing, so this year would be 2013. Choose your crop, and what this is going to do is it's going to bring in some defaults <coughs> for what the crop coefficients are for a particular crop. It's going to bring in default growing dates, growth dates. It's also going to bring in default uh, MAD number that would be, might be appropriate for that crop, as well as root zone depths that we've kind of put together. Um, Again, these are defaults, and maybe your, your crop or your variety is a little different or whatever. So, but you can play with these, but it's going to help you start by choosing just your crop. In this case, you just go pick field corn or, or maybe grass hay or something like that. Then your field soil, you choose your, what your soil texture is, and that's going to um, bring in defaults for your water holding capacity, your field capacity, your wilting point, etc. And then uh, choose your nearest weather station, the one that's nearest you. And then from then on, it'll pull all that data from that weather station on a daily basis to set it up. So in this area, um, there's where the weather stations are. Um, here's Linden. We're, we're right about right here right now. So there's ones, you know, so whichever one, and I'm not sure exactly what the names of these are. 
if you go on AgWeather.net and you mouse over this, it'll it'll show you what the name of it is. It's Linden. That's by Clark's. Very, very plan. The one at Nooksack is at the Nooksack High School. This one is? That's Lawrence. Oh, okay. This one? Yeah. And the one's down at Lawrence. Lawrence? The one's out in the 10 mile. Yeah. We're, we're closest to the 10 mile. This one here. The uh, crop reference for alfalfa, is there a way we can get that changed to grass? We do have cooler season area, and our grass does grow at a different rate than alfalfa. The, uh, the use of that tool is, I've worked with it quite a bit, and it's it fairly handy to be able to talk to producers about but that alfalfa and the difference between that. Uh, again, it would get a lot of crop growth earlier in the year. Our reading depths are a lot different. Yeah. Uh, and when you have to go in and change it within the, the matrix, it takes a bit to do that. Yeah. So for growing the start of the season. And yeah. then also the cuttings. The question is, when someone takes a cutting, yeah. how does that affect yeah. that BTU? Yeah. <clears throat> Great questions. So um, the whole model is set up using, so his question is, can we get it for, there's two different ways to do reference ET. One is based on alfalfa and the other one is based on grass. So he's saying grass reference alfalfa. Grass reference ET, he feels, might be more, is that what you're asking? If we can get it to a silage crop, that's being cut all the time because usually yeah. the grass is more of a one cut system that still is yeah. still. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, basically, all the crop coefficients and everything are set up for alfalfa reference ET. And so you can just you can mess with the crop coefficients, but it wouldn't be possible for us without a major overall to make it work with grass reference ET. But we did this season, we added because we knew that that was a problem because with silage and, and everything that you're, you're chopping, forages especially, what happens is your crop, your, your ET goes up and then you cut it, right? And then, so it used to be this tall, now it's this tall. So it uses a lot less water then and it drops back down and it takes a while before it climbs back up to where it was. And we did, we, we put in um, the ability to add cuttings in there and so, Actually, whenever you select a, a forage crop like alfalfa or grass hay or something like that, it'll, it will allow you to, um, whenever you uh, add an irrigation event, it will allow you to say, there's a checkbox to say, I cut, I cut on this date, and then it'll, it'll reset back down. So that's, that's just this year, this winter. We, we also, another thing. Okay, well, let, me, let me finish. Um, okay, we assume that the root zone starts. So there's just two dates for the root zone growth. We say we start, and this is kind of your planting depth, and then it would go up to a maximum managed root zone depth. If I have a perennial crop like alfalfa or, or um, berries or uh, you know grass hay or something, then basically this would probably just be flat across. Um, depending on, on what you want to assume. But then it, it assumes that it reaches this maximum uh, root zone depth the same day you get full cover. So we just, we just try to, to make it simple so people can mess with it. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, let's see if we can... Okay, okay so here is... Here it is. Um, and that we pulled it up uh, earlier, and I don't know if we have an internet connection anymore. Or not. But let's, so this this shows this this is for my pasture, and you can see that I simulate. And so these green dots here are the irrigation events, by the way. And then blue, we've actually kind of had a wet year so far in Western Washington relative. And then um, over here, this is the, uh, these are, so this is the last, so this is, this is yesterday. And here, what it gives you says the water use. So this is reference ET, and then it multiplies it by a crop coefficient behind the scenes. And it gives you an estimate of how much water your plant used in inches every day. And then rain plus irrigation. So it measures rainfall at the weather station and 
automatically brings that in. And I know that rainfall is highly variable, and this is part of the reason why there's uh, rain gauges in the back. But you can uh, adjust that by going in here and you click edit on any of these one days, on any of these days, and you can you can um, include um, you can uh, put in like if I irrigated on this date, I would put it in there as well. Available water content, so 100% would be fuel capacity, full bucket, zero is empty bucket, wilting point dead, and so this is your available water percent. Um, and then here's my soil water deficit. You can, you can, we also changed this so you can put it in two different ways. Some people uh, like to look at irrigation, they think in terms of hours of irrigation, some people think in terms of inches. And so we made it so you could do one or the other. Right now I have it set up in hours. And, edit. and then we also included a one week forecast. We pull based on where your weather station is. We have latitude and longitude and we can go hit on a National Weather Service database and it'll give us maximum min tem minimum temperatures for the next seven days and we run that through a different uh, evapotranspiration model and it'll give us a one week forecast of how much water uh, it thinks the plant will plants will use in the next seven days. Where's um, this pasture located at? This is in my backyard. Is that in eastern Washington? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at the rainfall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you watering it now? No, I didn't. You guys, you better get ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Better get home. I, yeah. I, yeah. And actually, this is a lot. Yeah. I, I think that's a lot. <laughs> It's, it's, it's going to be dry here in a minute. Yeah, yeah it's going to be a Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I've been watching. So here's, and then you can see this. So here's my soil water content bounces up. Here's on the irrigation that day. You know, it came back down and I irrigated again, and then it came out and had a little bit of rainfall. It kind of kept it up high, and then it came back down. And then see, you know, like you said, it, it uh, looks to be a hot week, and so I better get irrigating because here's what I looks like for the next seven days. It's going to be really dry and indeed. Uh, how accurate is the rainfall at the station itself? At the station, it's, they try really hard to be accurate with the rainfall, but rainfall is highly variable and spatially. I, I live a mile away from the So it should, at. I would use it if it was me. And it's way off. Oh, it is? Yeah. Really? High or low? Low. Low? For what, why rain? Because I got a U.S. Uh, weather Service uh, number eight. Oh, PM, oh, really? And it's 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 like a third sometimes. Oh, really? Sometimes it's fairly close. The temperatures are. They might have every station. I mean, all the sensors. There's lots of them, and they they try to keep up and they check each of them every three times a year. But sometimes, you know, they might not be calibrated right. We have a huge variability in rainfall across the county, too. Yeah. Within 10 miles, you can have 20 inches annual difference, just due to topography. So, so what I could do, if, if I clicked on here, this daily budget table, it would open up this thing. Let's see if I can do it. Let's say, like, uh, okay, yesterday, or the day before yesterday. Oh, it worked. <laughs> uh, it'll allow me to put in an irrigation event. So in this case, I would change it. I'll show you how to change it to uh, um, inches, um, but or hours, and then the soil water available. So if if I measured, if you measured a rainfall that was different from what was, so you would have to add in some additional uh, you can do rainfall that. here. Yeah, right here. You would just just say it was an irrigation, even though it wasn't. And it would be fine. The other thing is if you um, if you have a soil moisture sensor out there. And this is a model, right? And so it gets off over time. It might not be right. Um, and if you have so much a sensor, or uh, then you can come in here and you can change this number, soil water availability, and say, like for example, let's say it says I have 75% water, and I, I go out in my field and I say, I got water stress. I think it's more like 45. So I would go in here, and then I would change this to 45. And then I'd say use that and then update my field. Let's see if it'll work. Okay, it's working slowly. There we go. So it changed just from that day on, it fixed it, and it went to, to 45. 
So <clears throat> basically, if, if it turns yellow, that's warning, and red means you know, you're below your MAD line, which means you're, you're in the water stress. You can put uh, irrigation events out in, in the forecast as well. Okay, so the, the two main things that you're going to play with is this daily budget table. This is what we're in right now. This is what shows you the numbers. The soil water chart, which shows you this, what the soil, you know, just kind of give you a visual of what's happening. There's also some more charts here. Um, this shows the daily water use estimate. This is, you can see how this has changed over the season. Um, the cumulative water, it shows you the total, uh, here's total rainfall, it's cumulative rainfall. Here's cumulative irrigation, these green dots, and here's this black line is the, the total uh, crop water use and how that changes over time. Uh, the cumulative, uh, you can look at the crop coefficients that are being used. Remember we talked about those, the, those different stages. So in this case, um, because we're not throughout the whole season, it just shows the first part of it. But here's the crop coefficient that's being used, and also the, the root zone depth. So here's root zone, it assumes that my roots go to 36 inches, and I actually started them at like 25, 26 inches or something like that. I assume you had a little bit of a root dieback uh, during the winter. Here's my crop coefficient. So you could go in there and play with things if, if you wanted, if your situation was a little bit different and you wanted to, uh, to make yours work a little bit. A little bit more representative, you can play with it. Um, if I lose water to deep percolation, you know, I get too much water and I have water that runs out the bottom of my root zone, um, it keeps track of that. Um, and then water stress, if I ever go below the soil water content, the MAD line, then it'll show me. Um, and it's a real simple model of, of how much yield reduction that I probably experienced with, uh, due to water stress. In my case, there hasn't been any so this far. But I could go and let's look at some of my other fields. This was in 2011. You can set up an unlimited number of fields. If you're a crop consultant, you can set up 300 fields if you want to. So here's the crop coefficients for this. Let's see <clears throat> what we have for water stress. I just had one point where I went through it. And then not enough to even experience any water yield reduction due to that. So the other thing is down here in manage fields. They'll say uh, you can add a new field. Um, you can delete the field that's right here. You can just kind of reset it based on the defaults. Um, but in here, the field settings, um, here's how, uh, okay, I'm in a different field now, but I can, right now it's using um, inches, but I can use hours instead of inches. Um, but you need, you need to know your application rate. So let's say sprinkle irrigation. It'll help you calculate what your application rate is. But the other, but it also brings in these, um, the soil water con. These are the defaults that brought in for water holding capacity based on the, the crop you chose and the soil texture you chose. And if you know better numbers, then you can put those numbers in and play with those. So like these crop coefficients, etc. So uh, you had a question about forages. Let's go do that. So let's go back to manage fields. Let's add a, add a new field. <clears throat> um, well, let's call this um, cut hay. And let's, let's, let's use last year's data just so that we have a full season. Just for, and then let's use ag weather net. Um, and then what's the station you said somewhere near yeah. What? Ten miles. Ten. Uh, ten miles. This is the ten mile grade. And let's say crop, let's say grass, um, grass hay, and then let's choose a soil. What's a good one? Fine. Sandy loam. Sandy loam. Sandy loam. Doesn't really matter. The other thing that we added in here is this checkbox. Uh, to, um, let's see if I'll go back. 
checkbox to start with an existing field. Say I, I did a lot of tweaking to get things right for my soils and everything, and I just I, I, I want to duplicate that for five more fields. I can start with an existing field, and then it's gonna it's gonna duplicate a lot of those parameters for that field. Okay, so let's go. So here's what it shows. Uh, I didn't irrigate at all last year, um, and so we had plenty of water to begin with as the roots grew in my grass hay field, but then we kind of ran out. Here's all my irrigation events, and so we would have seen quite a bit of stress later in the season if we didn't irrigate at all at, at 10 mile. What's, what's the date that it says there for last year that we should have started irrigating? It doesn't show uh, irrigation start. You have to. You would have to put in um, the actual dates here. So let's where, go in. Where it crosses the map. Where it crosses the. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So it says. It says you know you probably should have. You might have irrigated anywhere in here. Actually, you probably would have been. But you can't. You can't predict rainfall, right? So it, I wouldn't have faulted anybody for waiting, but. Uh, when you came down here, you probably should have definitely hit it. So this was, uh, actually we can go and look at it right here. It didn't rain for 90 days. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you had a really long dry spell. From the middle of July, mid to late July to the middle of August. It's about mid July when people started here. So let's, let's go, um, let's go back to September, August, yeah, July, let's go July 1st. Start the irrigation right now. Looks like it was a little earlier. Even. Okay, here's uh, late June is when it, when it ran out of water, and then um, that'd be the drier soils. Yeah, so let's let's. That's a sandy loam, so yeah. A lot of yours would have been a little bit. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it was out of water. So if we went in here and <clears throat> go back. Oops. The hay intake too. I, I, I warned you that that's a little bit lower than what you're getting. Oh, right. through the newer high intensity fields, you're getting a lot more uptake. So this is my the, the number that I would care about if it was me is this soil water deficit in, in inches. So this is how much this is how far below field capacity you are. So if I was going to irrigate today, this is how much water I would irrigate. Okay, and the, the, the number for today, even though this is last year, uh, the number for today is highlighted in, in red. So, but, so, two, so if I was gonna, if today was the 30th, and I wanted to refill back up the field capacity, I'd put two and a half inches on. Two and a, trying to get two and a half inches into the, walk, into the soil is kind of hard. You probably have runoff, so you might want to do it in two swipes or something. Um, but let's say uh, I edit, Let's say I did irrigate on the 29th, and so I can, let's say I, I put on one and a half inches. And then so, so from then on, you can see that it has adjusted up. So to get into this, you got to go to the home page and go to uh, just weather.wcu.edu slash is. Get you there. Um, but but actually to set it up, you have to go <clears throat> weather.wcu.edu, or actually if you just type ag weather net in Google, it right. will come to the top. When you, when you sit 44 percent, when you went down, is, is, is that allowing greater or less moisture to be extracted from the soil? When you say 44. 44 percent of the available okay. water capacity would be more. You're falling more down than 50 percent. You're allowing it to become drier? Yes. Okay. The, the, uh, the number on that. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. When you're when, at 70%, you'd be wet. When you're at 40%, you'd be drier than that. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, the rooting depth for our soils, for especially if they're high water table, is critical. So if you have a high water table, you may want to play with that. Because a lot of times they'll put three feet in. I think it's the grass one. So you may want to check that. Okay. The tiles, if you have tiles, if you have them on the back, um, water will look fast as well. I just think I'd rather go down for that. But you can see everything, even though it, it's, it's, it's got a, it's a really squished, so it's made for use on a smart in the same field. Looks like I lost my internet connection. It has been going in and out. Yeah. <laughs> it, there's a lot of data that you can put in there. So it's really yeah. Good. Yeah. Go get it. Go get that water. The manure application is going to sell that place. We can sell 16 feet. Third to a half inch of manure application three times before we get to irrigation time. That that can add a little bit of water. Not a lot, and you can actually see that, that it didn't add a whole lot, so you should be adding some more irrigation water. Yeah. yeah. Or, or. The other thing, because every pretty much everybody uses big guns, is that right? Not everybody. What else? It's mostly going to injection. Drake goes injection. Yeah. Oh for the yeah. manure. Yeah. Oh okay. The big gun for irrigation. So oh, okay, yeah. Okay. There's still some boil on. Okay. Okay. So one thing that everybody asks is, okay, I ran it. Uh, what is my actual application rate? Um, on, if you go, uh, and right now for some reason uh, our website is down, but I'll have it fixed by next week. It's irrigation.wcu.edu. There's a bunch of calculators on there, and one of them is the application rate for a big gun. If you enter what your flow rate is out of your nozzle, um, and uh, your flow rate and your drag speed, you're pulling it in, as well as your width for each setting, it'll tell you about how much water you're applying each time. But if you don't remember that, there is, if you, there's, a, there's a formula in this book too. Let me, if you go to flows, Look on page 32. 32 and 33, there's some formulas in there that if you can put your set time in hours, your flow rate in gallons per minute, your system efficiency, which for a big gun, you should probably use 60%. So that's 60% efficient. Time of day? That would, uh, it would versus. That's right. It would affect it a little bit, actually. Maybe up, I don't know, maybe up to like 10% different. We're actually doing some research on that, very question. But the traveling big, big gun sprinkler on page 33, it'll show you um, what uh, ways to, how to calculate that. But if you have, you know, access to uh, the internet or on your phone, we've got a, a small, version of, of those calculators that you can use on a smartphone as well. So anyway, lots of tools how, there available. How would that dif be different than just setting up a rain gauges on the field? Because you're pulling the gun. The oh. rain gauges is the right way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the That's best way. But if you don't do that, you can estimate yeah. it. Well, way. figuring out you know, right. full rate at the nozzle would be harder to do than set up a rain Yeah, gauge. sometimes on those they have Charts that'll show you, okay, with this nozzle size and this pressure, we do this. So, yeah. um, but rain gauge is the right way to do it. But realize that um, irrigation systems aren't perfectly uniform, right? And so, mm -hmm. some places you're going to get more water, and some places you get others. So, you yeah. kind of have to we kind of move it around. Okay, good. That's that's the right way to do it. Yeah, yeah so and we get a lot of wind here, too. Yeah, when we're irrigating, we, we yeah. did have a publication. For the solo cup, and that's for manure at least you can throw them away. But yeah, oh, no, the, right. the, the makes it easy, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah oh, it has the diameter already functioned in, so you okay. just time. time yeah. Time. Talk about a party, right? Red solo cup. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> yes. Not the ones with manure in it, though, please. <laughs> They're cheap. They're cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Is there a component in here about economics? Uh, because it, 
in some areas, don't utilities have different rates for depending on the time you use the electricity? That you could yeah. actually schedule yeah. the irrigation? And every, every utility does it a little differently. And, and a lot of times, uh, you, you have a good point. A lot of times, if you irrigate at night or sometime when there's, there's just not a lot of demand for electricity, they'll, they'll give you a break on it. But yeah, we, we haven't integrated economics into this yet. Um, be, there's a lot of things we could do with it and want to do, but we, we, for now, we've kind of tried to keep it intuitive and usable, and we didn't want to add a lot of things that would make it complicated so that people couldn't figure it out. So, doing that for now. <laughs> Question. Um, seems like one problem if you if you need to irrigate more frequently, that you're going to have greater evaporation losses. It's true. Yeah. I mean, and if your evaporation losses are already 40 percent, as yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems yeah. like you would want to water as deep as you could in exactly. order to avoid that problem too. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And so, you know, ideally, you would go all the way to that M80 line, refill it right. just up to the pit, but People who usually aren't that good. I'm not that good. So we're right. just trying to get right. somewhere right. in there. <laughs> but it might, you know, but if it was just water, I mean, well. Yeah. Well, I, I did a, a center pivot evaluation for this guy that was, uh, he had heard somewhere, read in a publication that, that plants get water through their leaves. So he was irrigating this alfalfa field. He had this pivot and he was just 100% and it was running around and around and around. Right, right. And terrible yields, of course, because none of that water was actually getting in the soil and, um, because he was just trying to keep it wet and he had disease problems. So that's <laughs> it's problem. getting the worst. Yeah, 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 so that's not a great thing. Because he's, what happens is the more time that right. water is sitting on the leaves and you got more of that evaporating, you get just much worse I mean, they do say efficiency. Like Redwoods and so forth, they do get a certain amount of their moisture out of the fog. You know, there is that. Yeah, but yeah. I can I mean, see but it's just small compared to what they can get out of it. Right, so, right. Yeah. But I can see yeah. that would be. He had drought and yeah. botrytis at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Opposite of hydroponics. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a call if you have questions. I'd be more than happy to uh, talk to you guys one on one. I mean, that's my job. So, well, let's uh, thank our speaker, Mr. Roy, um, and uh, we'll stick around a little bit for more, if you have more questions or anything else as well. Yeah, I I guess one thing for sensing uh, stuff. So okay, I guess I can please. do that super no. quick. Yeah, keep on moving. Okay, the, the most, the most um, commonly used ones are these watermark sensors. And basically, what it is, let's see if I can find this one. Um, I'm sorry. But basically, it's just this little, uh, this little piece of gypsum, like this that's in the wallboard. And then uh, it's in, inside of there, and you've got two little wires stuck in there. And when the when that gypsum gets wet, the resistance between those two wires gets lower. And so you can measure the resistance right here, and then you can turn that into an estimate of soil water tension, or how hard that soil is pulling on the water. And so as this dries down, you know, the water will get dr drawn out of this sensor and out of that gypsum and into the soil, and it'll get the resistance will go up as it gets wetter. And so this is an estimate will give you an estimate of soil water tension. Um, and uh, the reason people use these is, is that they're fairly inexpensive. Um, and, but it kind of, it can't, it doesn't really tell you when, I mean how much to irrigate, it just kind of tells you when your soil is dry. And basically these, the accuracy of these isn't, isn't super great, um, but most people don't know what a meaningful number is to irrigate at anyway, so what I would do is just, you know, first sign of water stress, okay, there's the number I don't want to ever get to in the future and, and do it that way. And so you can glue, base, the sensor is only this green part, but they glued a little bit of PVC on the end of it so they can install them at different depths 
um, in the soil, and they leave a little bit of uh, wire hanging out. And they can read it. Oh, oh, here's the actual sensor. So and you can read it with this little meter. You just clip on those alligator clips on the end, and you push start, and it'll uh, or read, and it'll go. Um, and this is a tensiometer, and basically the same kind of thing. This is a porous ceramic cup, and I just broke this one on this morning. Um, but it, what happens is because the, the pores in this ceramic are so small that the that water tension that I talked about holds it together, so the soil can slowly pull that water out of the out of this, but the air can't get in. So actually, if I bury this in the soil, the soil will pull the water out of this. I fill this tube full of water, and then the, the soil will pull that water out of there until it's at an equilibrium with the soil tension inside as well as the soil, and then um, I can read that tension on this gauge. So this, again, is soil water tension. It'll kind of give you the same um, measurement in centibars is, as uh, what this will. So, and there's different lengths of these um, that will show you. And then there's a whole bunch of other water, soil water sensors. Here's one of them that bear, you can bury, and they uh, use different waveforms. They send electric pulses down this, and it captures it. It's kind of complicated, but basically this will give you uh, an estimate of soil water content. Um, this is one of them. There's a whole range of different ones. Um, the, major, the biggest class is what's called a capacitance sensor, and basically, I don't know if you know much about electronics, but you can, you can measure the capacitance of, of something that goes between two contacts. And so they take these two electrical contacts and they put it like right next to the soil, and then with that, they can, the, the capacitance depends on how much water is in the soil, and uh, so they can use, they have these electronics that will measure the capacitance, of the soil and then you turn that into a soil water content. The problem with those um, is, the good thing about them is, is that they're electronically readable. You can have them hooked up to a um, uh, uh, telemetry system so you can, you know, in the morning in your underwear you can check what your soil water content is um, uh, in, on your computer or whatever. But the bad thing about them is, is because it's very highly influenced as to what's happening right there, right at the sensor, and it doesn't go out very far into the rest of the soil, it's very highly dependent on installation practices as well as you know, what's happening right there at the sensor. And so um, they tend to be kind of variable, um, but they're repeatable. And again, since nobody really knows what a good number is to start at anyway, and you just kind of give yourself a little bit of feedback with that over time. But that, that will give you soil water content. A lot of them are buried in tubes where the capacitance sensors are kind of like in rings that press out uh, against the outside of these, uh, these PVC tubes that are buried in, etc. So anyway, if anybody has any additional questions about those, you can talk about it. I went a little long, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. Thanks. You can come look at this stuff. And we've got rainy.